All right, special episode of the Ohio Cast podcast tonight. We have the officials edition, and we are promoting the officials for the Ohio Athletic Committee, a special edition on the mat with officials and talking to Elliot Spence tonight. Elliot, one of the young up-and-coming officials in the state of Ohio, uh, ref this year's OHSAA state tournament. How many OHSAA state tournaments for you, uh, Elliot? That was my second. Your second. How many OAC tournaments for you? I actually haven't done the OAC. I've I've coached at it many times. I haven't been well, up there to officiate it yet. Okay, but you've never officiated it. Would you be opposed to it? No, I would not. I'd I'd love to go back up there. I haven't been to Youngstown in a couple of years, so it'd be great to get back up there. It's awesome competition. I love the tournament. It's beautiful in March. Everybody knows that about Youngstown. But um, Elliot, uh, just real quick, when we get into this. Uh, are some of our proud sponsors and partners with the Ohio Athletic Committee. We have a new product with the Ohio Athletic Committee. We have Spider Matte Tape. They bring a fresh shipment of matte tape for each season. It hasn't been sitting in, back in a warehouse for 20 years and gooey and gross. Have your athletic directors get on it. Check it out at oac.com backslash spider with a Y. Also, uh, one of your best friends, a Barbarian Apparel, Josh Sasfi. First off, what is your relationship to Josh Sasfi and why are you guys so tight? So me and Josh go back to our college days. We wrestled teammates together at uh, Mount St. Joseph, now Mount St. Joseph University. Um, still live very close to each other. My mom actually works at Barbarian with Josh, um, but we bike together at times. I started to scale back biking with him because he's transforming into like Lance Armstrong. He might be wait, in Wait, wait, wait. Are you saying Josh is on PEDS? Is he on performance enhancing drugs? We, I, you're alleging, or are you alleging? I mean, he just he just biked worker. from Cincinnati to Cleveland, so it's it's not out of the question. I'm I'm wondering how he ac- accomplished that in three days. So, I mean, you know, we'll we'll get to that. It's that it's like suspicious. Three hundred twenty one miles, I think he sent me. Three twenty one or three twenty nine, something like that. But yeah, you yeah, start with your tire that's in awesome. the Ohio River, and you yeah. end when it gets to Lake Erie. And he just did that because he's a maniac. Yes, he is a lunatic. What? Uh, the uh, USADA will definitely be down there next week in Cincinnati at the Barbarian Center off of Cro- Crookshank Road, I believe. And, yes, it okay, is. So where did you go to high school? I went to Cincinnati Elder. So right around the corner from Barbarian Apparel. That's correct. Literally under two miles is Elder High School, correct? That's correct. So it's uh, the connections are close. How far Elder from uh, Mount St. Joe? Uh, maybe maybe four or five miles. Oh, wow. It's all, so it's all right there. And then, now yes, where do is. you live? I live closer to Harrison. So I'm about as far Southwest Ohio as you can get. So I live technically in Colerain Township, but if you go out of my house, I'm in Col or I'm in Harrison or Green Township by Oak Hills High School very quickly. So, but I'm, I'm, pre- I'm basically right next to Harrison. All right. So the bias is very, very deep indeed when it comes to barbarian apparel. One of your college teammates uh, you know, the business is just a stone's throw away from, you know, where you guys were college teammates and where you went to high school. How did you do in high school at Cincinnati Elder? I went to state three times and then took six my last year. I was uh, ranked second going into the state tournament and just did not have a good state tournament. What year did you st- uh, place at the state tournament? 2004. 2004. And then um, as far as college, what was your best finish? Did you ever qualify for the NCAA tournament at Mount St. Joe? I did. I took eighth twice, and then I was an NCAA runner-up my last year. So you're your three-time D3 All-American. Yes. You understand the sport of wrestling a little bit? Just a little. <laughs> Try to stay up with it. Looking forward oh. to the Olympics right around the corner. Yeah, that's that's coming up, man. I think we're going to have a great uh, team. And, um, you know, what doesn't – what helps but doesn't help is the Russians not being um, included in the games this year. Uh, due to the definitely definitely helps helps the United States, but it's you know sure. if you ask anybody on that team, they're gonna they're not happy that Russia is not gonna be there. I mean it's it's gonna be it's gonna be different without them there. I mean I was looking forward to a lot of those matchups. Sitikov, I, I can tell you right now, Kyle Date wants to beat Sitikov. Yeah, um, there's no question in my mind he wants to wrestle that guy anywhere, anytime. He wants that rematch from the World Championships. Obviously, Kyle Snyder. Wants another crack at Sajulayev. Um, and, and we know, you know, that that um, uh, when you muddy the waters with politics and sport, it just not at all, you know, nobody wins, right? Yeah. Uh, it kind of sucks, but, you know, I think we're going to have a great run. Um, Greco, 
Bay got added. So yeah, I like that. And then I think our women's team's lights out. I think Helen, um, Helen can win another uh, Olympic title. And I think the blades, uh, you know, Kennedy blades is obviously, this is the, we're, where I think we're watching the start of a, um, of a great all time, great women's wrestling career in the sport of wrestling. I agree it, with you. Yeah. With women's freestyle. So I'm a big fan. I, I, you know, and then obviously Helen's a, a legend. So I, I, you know, the, just off the top of my head, there's, you know, Spencer Lee, obviously his first one, uh, Joe Ruau Ruau getting um D three D another D three guy. Yep, yep. Was he Al- Elmhurst? Elmhurst? Yes, he was. He was Elmhurst. Elmhurst. Yeah, great guy too. Super nice guy, and um, quite the uh, story. So, uh, uh, when did okay? So your state placer in Division One Ohio, three time Division Three NCAA All American NCAA finalist. When did you start the sport of wrestling, Elliot? I started when I was in second grade, and it was all because of WWF. I mean, me and my younger brother would watch that and use our parents' bedroom as like the bed and jump off the the dressers. I was our top rope. And my dad's like, I'm introducing you to wrestling. And he drove us up to Elder High School, got involved with the uh, youth program. And I've been doing it ever since. Literally, well, same story he tells. There you go. So, so listen, when he, whenever he does his, well, hey, it's just Nick Nemeth now. He got, yeah, yeah. He got canned. Um, he tells the story that a lot of his stand-up, when he showed up at St. Pat's, which is a West Side uh, Catholic school in uh, Cleveland, he was like, well, where's all the ropes? Where's the rope? Where's the turnbuckles? You know what I mean? Did you have a similar experience to that when you showed up and there were no ropes and no turnbuckles and no no stage? I mean, I can't I can't remember that far, but I, I'm sure I did because he was like, that's it. I'm, I, I remember him being like, I'm showing you the real wrestling because my dad wrestled when he was in high school. And, you know, I, we went up and got involved with the youth youth program and i just stayed that's that's the reason i went to older high school because my brothers both went to oak hills the public school but i was oh, i was the only one of us that stayed with wrestling from youth through high well through college um uh, my younger brother ended up wrestling in high school as well but he didn't take it from youth all the way through like i did gotcha so you go way back with the sport in the greater cincinnati area uh where were you uh raised oak hills area yeah, Dill High Township. So uh, not far from, yeah, like Elder High School, No Kills High School. Okay, so not Cincinnati far from Pro- not far from the BA Center. Still lived right there. But in Cincinnati the heart of BA proper, Center. Cincinnati yes. proper, or suburb, suburb, suburb. Okay, because like um, Andy Rovat, for example, when you said Andy Rovat, well, where are you from? You know, you talk to these guys, you talk to Nick Demuth, you talk to Andy Rovat, and you ask them where they're from. Well, I'm from Cleveland, and I'm like, no, 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 no. Are you from like? Are you from uh? You know, like uh. Westlake, where the Paul brothers are from? Are you from mm-hmm. Bay Village? Are you from Menor? Are you from Sugar and Falls? Are you from Hudson? No, I'm from Cleveland. <laughs> Those two guys are literally Andy Rovat is from East Cleveland. Greg Urbis, the old head coach, lives mm-hmm. in East Cleveland. John uh, Heffernan, the head coach, lives in West. They live in the city of Cleveland, literally. Yeah. How wild yeah, so, is that? So, Delight Del- Township's like, Maybe from where my where I grew up, where my parents still live, it's probably a ten minute drive to like the Bengal Stadium from downtown Cincinnati. Gotcha. So okay. it's not too right terribly there. far, but okay. yeah. So uh, Cincinnati is a beautiful place. We did a spring like three day vacation there over our spring break, and I love going there. We took a riverboat tour. My kid was talking about it today. Um, we go to um, Co- Coventry. Or, uh, Covington. Covington. Covington's Covington, yeah. beautiful. The aquarium there, Newport Aquarium. Um, do a couple things. There's like a, a levee mall, I think it's yep, called. Newport, that's Newport on a levee. Where yeah, the, and then, um, just that's where the uh, aquarium is, and then the the <clears throat> excuse me, the boat cruise. Did you do like the B and B boat cruise where it's yeah, like the yeah. the old fashioned looking yep. boats and everything? Like paddle wheel, but it's yep. actually not it running. It's the yeah. <laughs> uh, board motors. Looks uh, cool. I love Cincinnati. It's a great place. Um. Cincinnati strong in wrestling. I think, you know, they're usually there. It's Columbus has been coming up because the population of Columbus has exploded yeah. for, for a long time. Cincinnati was, was right there neck and neck some years challenging Northeast Ohio, but now with Columbus, the explosion of the population in Columbus. Now it's kind of like they're neck and neck with Cincinnati with Columbus. Would you say that? Yeah. Oh, for sure. I mean, you look at like Watterson, they're absolutely loaded. They're a very, yeah. very good, well-coached program. And, have hammers up and down yeah um so what degree did you get from mount st joe 
I finished, uh, I did sport management with a minor in business and then moved out to Philadelphia, was there for two years, got my MBA, coach, was a grad assistant at Delaware Valley University. Okay. And what do you do now for a living? So I do, um, I'm really utilizing that sport management background I gained and I do consulting for banks. I do like digital implementations for <laughs> banks and credit unions, financial services. Um, is that so, what Coastal is? Coastal is your consultant? Yeah. So Coastal, my background here, that's the company I work for. We are a Salesforce consulting firm, Salesforce, like the CRM platform. And that's why I do all Salesforce technology. So like we do like chatbots on the company's website. We'll do uh, loan origination systems, digital account opening. Um, so basically banking, cloud blending technology. Gotcha. So the other big thing when I look at it, when I talk to someone like you is you're so ingrained in the sport and you came back to, um, you know, the state of Ohio after being in Pennsylvania, were you in Pennsylvania or were you in New Jersey? I was in Pennsylvania. So we were right on the border. So yeah, I was right on the border, right? Yeah. Doylestown, Pennsylvania, right in the Lehigh Valley wrestling area. East end was just North, um, oh, right on the border. Oh. Oh, Easton, did you say? Did you oh, say yeah. Easton? Did you say I said Easton? Easton. That's the I king of Easton right there. there. Willie yeah, Saylor, right. if you didn't know. Hey, he didn't make it to the Olympic trials, so I, I took it upon myself to take the king of Easton's uh, Olympic trials sign. Even I, even I was at the Olympic trials. I saw I saw you on the floor I know, there. I know you're very, you're very hooked into the sport, but was that hard to come back and make the transition from coaching and what got you into officiating? So what got me in? That's a very, very good question. Um, so when I was out in Pennsylvania, and I still swear by this, and um, you know, maybe it make may make some people mad, but I go out to Pennsylvania and I'm coaching out there for two and a half years. So I'm recruiting Pennsylvania heavily, New Jersey heavily, New York heavily, and going to their state tournaments, going to all their postseason events and just watching and going to the PA New Jersey State Tournament was a freaking awesome experience. But watching that level of wrestling, but and then we transitioned to high school. And there's been some Ohio guys that have made the jump into college and been dominant, you know, on the mat. David Taylor, Logan Steber, and there's more of them. But PA guys and Jersey people, I mean, they are just hammers on top, especially PA. I mean, but I I really felt like it was the way it was officiated out there. They were allowed to wrestle that top and bottom position, well, top mainly, and work. Um now coming in, coming back in Ohio, what got me into officiating is I was coaching. I coached, you know, at Oak Hills High School, Elder High School, uh, Elder Junior High, and then after a while, I was at all these events, and it got harder with work for me to coach and put in that dedication. But I was watching some of the guys officiate, and you know, a lot of the guys. I mean, Dan Coleman, Bron Alexander, a lot of the Cincinnati guys, Rick Bach. I was already good fit friends with. And got to talking with some of them about making the jump into it because I just didn't have the time to, you know, to allow me to do it. But I wanted to be able to continue to give back to the sport of wrestling and officiating still has that like brotherhood that coaching and that wrestling on the team does. You become brothers with all the officials and you become a part of that family. But seeing the way the officiating was between Ohio or between Ohio and then PA New Jersey, I did feel like there was a little bit of a a difference in the way it was officiated and the way they let wrestlers wrestle. And I wanted to come back and hopefully make that impact and start to train the next generation of officials and, you know, start to, you know, put my mark on the sport in a different way rather than coaching. And I felt like officiating was the next best Avenue. And ever since making the jump, I've, I've, I love it. And I love all the officials I work with the coaches I interact with the wrestlers. It's, I think it's a, another great Avenue if you don't have the time to be able to coach like you would like to. So, you know, you, you come into this, um, this sport and, and how much different is it? You know, you're an NCAA finalist. You're a, a state placer in the biggest, toughest division in Ohio, right? So, and then you coached in the college level, got an MBA. You come back and, and how different is it from being in the chair or out on the mat officiating? Because there's guys who officiate who never wrestled, right? There's, mm -hmm. That's a thing, right? Um, you're not one of those guys. I would say you're one of the higher end uh, officials as far as wrestling career and wrestling credentials, Elliot. Um, but what, what's that difference like for you and how do you block it out, man? Cause I'm it's... a maniac when my nephews are on the mat or whoever's on the mat that I'm affiliated with. I know that I'm going on vacation with Scotty Burnett this week. 
I listen to these guys. I go and I do college movements and they get on the officials. How do you block that out? And how much different is it from being a competitor and a coach? It's a lot different. And I mean, I know it because I, I coached and I would harp on officials and like, oh, that's two, that's two, you know, that's, you know, that's an escape and just getting on them near fall, you know, and the way I was taught it when I first took my class and my, my trainer, Fred Feeney, I took his very first one weekend class, um, made it a lot easier to get on there and you got on the mat right away and officiated while you're in the class and it was a good adjustment, but he put it that way when you're, you're going to hear, you're going to hear coaches, like it's they're going to, they're going to get on you and they should, they're coaching their kids. If they did not, they're not doing their job. I mean, but you got to think about it. And this is what he said. They're watching the match with their hearts. We're watching it with our minds. And that's exactly what he said. And I, I a hundred percent believe that's true. And it is different. It's harder when you're out there because you see things and they develop and you want to pull the trigger and call it take, but you know, you got to let it burn because you got to truly let it settle and make sure there's actually control. The worst thing you can do is just rush the judgment and make that call. And it's not really there because once you make it, those wrestlers are now, you know, think that's two. I, or now it's going to be, that's three. I gave up the takedown. Now I'm going to start, you know, I'm going to belly out or something. Maybe, and you may have called it too soon. So I do think that's one of the hardest things is just being calm as an official. They're going to yell at you. It's going to happen. And they should be yelling at you, but you got to block it out and just let it work and let the, let the position settle before you're rushing to judgment and making that call. I do think that's one of the hardest things about it is being patient as an official and just letting the action happen. Um, and it, it's, yeah, it's, it's a world difference between coaching and wrestling and then getting on the mat and officiating it. So what was the adjustment period like for you? And was it less stressful? Was it easier using your mind rather than your heart in the sport of wrestling when you're, you're officiating and you have a rule set, right? Mm -hmm. As opposed to these kids or, athletes that you put you know hours weeks months years into what was that adjustment period like for you was it less stressful more stressful what was that like um i would say the adjustment it did take a while it wasn't like i came in my first year as an official even my second year i don't think i could have come in and done like a high high you know intense dual meet like a being down in cincinnati like an elder molar or like a molar lasalle um or a big public school duel down here, like a Lakota West, Lakota East in Cincinnati. No way I would have been ready for that in my first one, two, even three years to take that on. It, it's definitely an adjustment. And it's it's a learning experience. You got to get in and start to slowly acclimate to some of those bigger matches, you know, and like tournaments and stuff. Um, I'd say it, it was definitely an adjustment period of a few years before I really started to settle in and understand it. And it's, I mean, doing your first state tournament, even your first district tournament is a big eye opening experience. Um, getting in it and just once you do one, and I, I was told this if going into my first state tournament, you're going to get out there. You're going to be nervous. You're going to get your first couple of matches and you're like, all right, I'm good. This is, you know, this is an easier event. And the state tournament, the first couple rounds are, they are a, fairly easy thing then you get into the semifinals the semifinals like oh my gosh like that is just barn burner after barn burner and they did iron man this year that whole tournament is just a barn burner so um big learning experience you you advance you doing your first iron man your first state tournament it gives you three to four years experience in that one weekend that's wild man when you say that because it's, it's just such a high level and there's a lot of money on the line there too because all your college coaches are at the rounds of wrestling that you just mentioned, semifinals of the state wrestling tournament, yeah. I think the best round, uh, most exciting round. There's just too much going on for me to process it all. Yeah. Eight semifinals, two girls, you know, six boys, three divisions. That's tough for me. Um, but that Ironman semi, that Ironman quarter, I mean, it, it's just, it's crazy to think that some of the matches that have gone down in quarters and semis at the Ironman are some of the all time great matches, right? I oh, mean, yeah. Off the top of my head, Zeke Moisey, uh, Nathan Thomas Sala was Nito, a semifinal. The cradle and everything, uh, that was wild. Dean Heil, uh, Micah Jordan was a semifinal. Yeah, you know I mean, like, mm -hmm. you just say that, and those, those two matches pop into my mm -hmm. mind, and I'm like, oh, my God. And then the finals of the Ironman pressure cooker, right? So there's a lot on the line there. There's, you know, a lot of people have, have put their – it's this funnel. It's funnel. Mm -hmm. it's like their lives have funneled into these, these very small – quick fleeting moments and we've got to get it right as officials. So I you had, know, I had more ultimate tiebreakers at Ironman that I yeah. had all this year. 
These like are so just, good. Just that one. They're one so good. good. And those so are the good. toughest ones. Those ultimate tiebreaker because number one, you don't want to blow the whistle too early or anything because then you're or accidentally blow or something. It just there's just so much as an official that you could get wrong in those rideouts. Like yeah. So you got to you got to nail it. You got to get it right. And those are pressure situations. Not I mean, and it's like for me, like and you we got into it earlier. Why did you get into wrestling? Like I put everything I had into training, especially once I got to college into wrestling, like wanting to be the best, wanting to win a national title, wanting to get to the finals. I put everything I had into it. And sometimes I get out there and it's like, I feel like the officials being lazy. And I was like, that's how I can give back. Cause I put the same effort in. I know I do as an official as I did when I wrestled. Cause I want to get everything right. I never want to be that guy that blows a call and you're going to do it. It's ha- It happens. You're a human, but I want to do everything I can to make sure I'm in the right situation to make sure I'm fit and, you know, in the right shape to be able to get around and hustle around the mat to be in the right situation or be at least to be in the best possible situation I can to get that right and not, you know, be the one that determines the outcome of the match. And that's, you know, that's the real, like, you know, when I talk to people about it, like, why did I, why did I become an official? That's why, like it, these kids put so much into being the best to win Iron Man, to place at Iron Man, to, to get to the state tournament, you know, for an official to kind of, give 50% out there or 75%. No, we should be doing everything we can to nail that call. Cause it that's could come down to that. Elite. That's why you're elite at it though. That's why you're elite. And you're like one of the people that's on the list to talk to mm-hmm. uh, when, you know, when, when uh, Jared Opfer came to me and defense soap, defend what you have built. Got my bag me, back there. Well, Hey, when those guys came to me, you know, and Josh and, and, and those guys recognize something, spider Matt tape, they recognize something. OAC recognizes something. They know that they're charged with replenishing the ranks of officials because we're quite frankly, as you know, we're Mm -hmm. in crisis mode right now and sports are as bad as they've ever been, especially with specialization, especially with every parent putting tens of thousands of dollars into it, arguably a year, you know, years that are lives. Right. So they want the calls to be right. I get that. But at the same time, when it's such a high pressure situation and you're so out of your mind and you can't step back from the moment and realize these are just kids competing, that's when you start to drive officials out of the sport. Mm -hmm. I know, I know that I don't, I don't need you to agree with that. Yeah. That's where we're at though. And you know, that's where we're at. Yeah. I mean, all the guys that I mentioned earlier, the ones that I've been close with since I got into sport. Yeah, they all they all officiate they officiated my matches, you know, down here in Cincinnati, Dan Coleman, Rick Bach, Brian Alexander, Mark Schutte, uh, Dick Lowenstein are all guys that some of them have already retired. We have one that's coming back this year to help out some more. But I mean, all these officials all over the state that are very, very good. I mean, they only have, and they'll tell you, I mean, three to five years left officiating, and then they're gonna start. We're in bigger and- trouble. We're in bigger trouble than I'm even leading on at this yeah. point. Yeah, we're losing some very good officials because it's just, I mean, they've been doing it for 30 to 40 years. Sometimes more, some of them more than that. Ron Nisa. Ron yep. Nisa officiated me. Yep. And my brothers. He's been at it forever, dude. Like, I mean, those guys, Durr. Durr's done. Yep. It's crazy. Don Durr, man. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. I look at it and I'm just like, man, we are in big trouble. And, hey, step back. Don't be such a lunatic. How about that too, right? Like, mm-hmm. Calm down. Don't think so much with this. Think with this. And, I, you know, we're just, we're in a bad spot right now. And, and when the, when, when defense soap notices it, OEC obviously is at the highest level of noticing it. Yeah. OHSA obviously has to, but they're not, they have no skin in the game. They're not calling me up. Hey, Zab, can yeah. you do a podcast about how we can recruit people to the sport of wrestling as an official? Right. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, you're elite at it though. Um, if you suck or you make a mistake, I'll let you know there too. Yeah. <laughs> that's the, uh, and, I, and that's one thing I want people like when we make mistakes and I can show you this when we're done with this, I have a whole library of, I have a whole training library of like, when I see certain calls or it's on that wrestling officials, Facebook page, I save the videos down to file them away. So I had this whole Google drive of like takedowns, escapes, near falls, like line calls, like, and it's all filed away. So when we have training classes and our local meetings and I've, Every year when Iron Man happens, there's a slew of calls that come out. Like I save them all away. Let's, you know, in our classes, let's talk about this. Was this the right call? Yes or no? Why or why not? How would you be put yourself in a better situation? And 
but those are all things we got to talk to. So, and like, I have a bunch of my own calls in there. So I'm not just pulling everybody else out. I know I make calls that are very close. Some of them might be right. Some of them might be wrong, but I want, I want to know about it and I want to review it because I want to make sure it doesn't happen again. Or what can I do to be in the better situation? Yeah. Rusty. Rusty's one of my favorite uh, officials. Uh, Paul. Paul's a great official. Those you guys are, those are some of the best Ohio. That's who I worked with at uh all all weekend at state this year and in oh, districts. We're, we're districts and state, me and Paul together yeah. on the so same team. Paul made a tough call. DeLuca versus Blaze quarterfinals of the uh Ironman one year, and they <laughs> called Blaze for fleeing the mat. Delu and it's an overtime, and, and um DeLuca ends up winning the match. Blaze still hasn't given up a takedown. Is it, I saw that. I didn't, so I didn't you know. realize that until this year. You know. Hey, Elliot, I know you're brave enough to make that call, though, if you see it. If you just take it down. It, you're, I saw that. I didn't call. realize that, that he has not I, He has not given up a, like, offensive point in his high school career. But but to the point, Paul made a tough call. Mm -hmm. I think Paul, in the end of the day, some, you know, Scotty was, you know, Scotty Burnett's intense about it, right? And, um, I think that in his mind, he made the right call, right? And I go, hey, man, I had to take him. I go, this is one of the best officials Ohio has. This guy's good. Maybe he made a mistake, but in his mind, it was, it fit the criteria of the rule set. I, You know, and, I, and I, that guy's a great guy. I like that guy, and I don't ever see that guy just blow calls or or like no. you're saying. Um, one of the best. Like going out there and trying to be lazy or staying out late or just being a – no, I mean, that fit the rule set and the criteria – for what he called fleeing the mat. Yeah. It's that simple. And, you know, Blaze loses the match to DeLuca. He comes back and beats him for third and fourth. You know, he didn't have to wait 24 hours, right? Um, but that's just, you know, that's, that, that guy will make that call. That guy's not afraid if that's what he feels like is right. And, hey, that guy's an Ohio guy making that call against an Ohio kid. That tells you he's a high-character official, too, mm -hmm. right? Because then, oh, Homer calls. You guys are terrible. Um, one year, you guys had this crazy emphasis on taking the ankle takedowns, the, the shoestring takedowns on the edge. They weren't, you guys weren't calling them control. There was emphasis where you guys had to control and come work. up, come up to the knees. Yes. Remember mm -hmm. that? Yeah. Izzy Martinez rolled up on me at the iron man and screamed at me and he's like what are these officials doing and then mid-season it kind of like it kind of went away after a couple tournaments where there was clear takedowns and it was control right yeah what do you do in those situations and how how do you guys kind of learn on the fly and correct things on the fly um the, one of the things I, I look at and I always teach everybody and all the, when I talk to any of the other high level officials, this is what they tell me too, like body language. You're looking at the body language of the rest. Like now if it, it's, it's the same on out of bounds calls too. Like, is that guy still defending himself? Is he able to make defense? And it's a lot of them make it really easy on you where they just give that body language up. They're just giving up. They're on the edge. Like you're maybe around the ankles and they're turning and bellying out and just basically surrendering that they're position. bailing they're, they're bailing, bailing and out. surrendering it um same with like the other thing is you know if you're on the ankles and you elevate it and that guy on bottom has to brace himself and like put his hands back like to catch himself and support his weight to take down you're in control now because yes he's like he's there um so it's it's body language in a lot of situations My, it's crazy to me i see these things and i don't always agree with them but um I don't think it does me a whole lot of good and you guys a whole lot of good when I sit there and roast an official for making a bad call. It's I mean, okay. I, if, if I okay make a bad call, I want, it, to be, right? I want to be roasted. If I, if I make a bad yeah, call, I'm, I'm not always right. Up to it. The other problem there is I'm not always right. <laughs> yeah. Wrong a lot as a matter and of the, And the other thing, like a lot of these situations, kind of like we were just talking about Paul with the fling the mat. I mean, it's a bang, bang call and you yeah. see it that happens. You got to make your call. Now you can then go and talk to an official, but you've only seen it that one time for that split second. And what yeah. you saw is what you saw. And like we, you were saying it too, Paul's very, very good. And he knows what he's, that's why I loved working with him the last two weeks of this year. He was great. It's confident. And, and you go to him, you talk about it. Like, this yeah. is what I saw. And if your assistant saw something different, they're going to tell you. And then you got to go and make that call. It's your call as the head official, but you have that split second where you see it. Then you go back and you see it on video and you see it, and you can rewind it, you see it again, you can rewind it, but we don't have that out there. I, and I, that. I mean, 
NCAA, there's video review, but you know, in high school and stuff right now, there's not. Um, if it ever does come, it's only going to be at those like postseason tournaments, unless you know, you know, Iron Man and stuff like that may end up having it. Who knows? But we don't have that right now. So you get that one split second to see it, make that call, and it comes with that training and preparation, being in the right spot and being able to see it and know what's happening and call it. I think you guys have strong leadership as well with Ray Anthony. I like Ray Anthony. Obviously, Toby Dunlap. I think those guys are elite officials um, in their day and in their right when they were officiating, you know, full time. Right now, it's more of a rules interpreter uh, uh, position for those guys. Right? They're not. They're not zebra up. I guess as I would say. But um, I like your leadership. I, I think they're good guys. I think they're they're sane, rational guys. Um, they understand the sport. They understand uh, the emotions of the sport, but they also understand the rule set and how important it is for you guys to apply the rule set yeah. to the match and the action. I call they they probably get annoyed with me because I call all of them all the time during a season. Saw this. What do I call? What what's what do I do here? Like I'm bouncing stuff off of them all the time because yeah, they're they're awesome leaders. Uh Ray, Toby down in Cincinnati down here, we have Dick Lowenstein. Dick does a great job with it. Um, so I, I'm constantly pounding those guys as well as the other like up in the Dayton area I have a lot of officials you know I'm close with in the Dayton area that are very good like Chaz Deshays that I'm constantly calling him and other my, hey, my Chaz is instead. good Chaz is yeah. elite. I like Chaz he does yeah. a good job. I call him and we bounce stuff and you know not, not even like just on the mat stuff but we we're just talking about like training officials how do we get new officials involved like how you know training courses we're gonna run together so there's all kinds of stuff we're doing how do, how do I become an official hey Zub, get your fat loud mouth on the mat how do I become an official? Give me the, the the give me the process. So right now it is still um on my OSHA. So my my ohsa.org. Go on there, create a profile. Um, there's a link on there, become an official. You follow the link, go in, and it's gonna take you to basically a listing of you create your profile and it's gonna say what sport. Choose wrestling, and it's gonna give you all the options. And it's all online, self-paced, take it at your own pace, um, all video led. Um so you take all the coursework. It's through my rep. Or it's through ref rep. So you sign up through my OSHA. Then you'll get a link and somebody will be assigned to you a leader in that class. Like I do all the Cincinnati classes and I'll be in constant contact with you over email and stuff, directing you on where you need to go, giving you updates on how far you are in the coursework online. But again, it's all through ref reps. Once you pass, we'll direct you to your local association and they'll get with you about joining local meetings and stuff like that. You got to re up your membership every year. So taking the class is 70 bucks and that covers you for the year. And then every year after that, I think it's like 60. I don't know. I just paid it. Um, but it's uh, there's a renewal period. And usually it's by the end of June or July with a late fee by the end of July. This year it's through October. You have to pay your stuff. I do know, I don't know when, but I do know all of the coursework and signing up for officiating and taking the class is all going to be through Dragonfly. Gotcha. Um, so tell me about Dragonfly. What is Dragonfly with OHSA.org? Yep. So Dragonfly is not just wrestling. It's all officiating. It's where schools go to assign you events and also local assigners. They sign you all your matches on Dragonfly. So you have your schedule on there, when you need to be there. Are you doing JV? Are you doing freshman, varsity, what tournaments? So your whole schedule is assigned through Dragonfly. Schools then pay you right away through Dragonfly. So you get the money. Like You might be ref in the event and you get paid on it. But it's also like kind of like a PayPal account where your money just sits in there. And when you want to, you transfer it into your bank account. But soon enough, Dragonfly is going to be where you take your classes, where you do your um, any kind of coursework. Like I know a big mechanics piece is coming. Fred Feeney and Toby and others are leading that where they're they're going to be getting a mechanics piece into this because the online class is great. It makes it easy on everybody to become an official. But there's so much the most important stuff that you don't learn in that, like just the, I call it the soft skills of officiating. How do you handle yourself with a coach at the table? Like, how do you hold a call? What, like, how do you stay calm in those situations? So there's all those soft skills mechanics wise that you need to learn, but all of this is going to be through Dragonfly, the training, the, the assignments, getting paid for officiating is all going to be through Dragonfly. So Dragonfly essentially is your connector. It's your payer. It's your assigner. Yep. It's everything you essentially have to do. Dragonfly. And I'm guessing you can do everything on your smartphone. It's yeah, there's an app for it. It makes it very, it is very easy to use. We transitioned to Dragonfly last season. So it was a couple hiccups in the process, but it's, I, we have a whole guide made up. Uh, the leadership made a whole guide and emailed it to everybody. Here's how you sign up for it. They made it very seamless transition. 
Um, here's how you set up your account. Here's how you handle the app. Now everybody's got it. We're pretty good. We're, we're getting there. It's good to go. At what point do you think you step up into a role like Paul or Dusty Wilson or, or, or like, obviously you're not, you're, we, we know it's 30 years before you're Toby Dunlap or yeah. you know, Anthony, we, we get that right. But when do you step into to that elite role like Chaz Deshays and how do you get to where these upper officials who've been doing it 20, 25 years, how, what, what do you think you have to do? Do you have to do it? Do you do college, right? I think you do college, right? I got, I got my license. I'm certified in college. I didn't do any college events last year. I was just uh, transitioning to my new, my new job and okay. um, already You've done college. Tom. I have not. No, I, I have my license. Will you? I had, I would like to, the hard part is there's not a lot around Cincinnati. Um, you know, you got to go up to Columbus, Indianapolis, there's Mount St. Joe's here, but since I went there, I can't officiate Mount St. Joe. I'm like, basically conflict of interest got yeah, it. yeah you, you have to like on their stuff you actually have to fill out where you went to college did you wrestle anywhere did you coach anywhere and basically you can't do their events yeah like the um, elite ones there obviously are angel matt sorenskinski yep. kevin lynich um they're pretty good right i mean those guys those they're are the, very good and that's one yeah. of the things i like about it is they have their own little like training system like they're a portal of ref quest where you go on there and watch their training videos and they constantly release like mechanics like getting the call right, positioning, how to be in the proper, and then they have some great training. And that's one of the things I really like about it. So Matt's so that, leading that, a lot that, of that. That's angel. more of a, if you lived in the Columbus, Northeast Ohio area, and the, the opportunities were more, mm -hmm. more uh, I guess, numerous, that would be different for you. That, you know, you could do Western PA, you could do Northeast Ohio. Mm -hmm. Like a Soren Chinsky, I, he was in Northeast Ohio. He might've moved. Um, I know Lineage is in Northeast Ohio. So Ken and Tag Leonata. Yep. He's still in a lot of them, Northeast Ohio ones. So, yeah, there's I, you know, there's a core of uh, guys that I see. John, the guy, John, the, the PA guy who called the pin against Spencer Lee in the summit. Do you know John? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I, John, yeah. John, John, so, so PA, the guy's the man. Like we were talking about like getting yelled at, like gosh, man, doing those Big Ten events and stuff. Like talk about getting like just hammered when you're like hammered and everything. Woo, that's tough. Uh, John. But, does not care. Yeah. <laughs> so that's one of the he's blocking that out. Whew, it's amazing, man. actually. He's really, really good. Uh and officiating the NCAA tournament would be fun, but I love watching it. Like I already, you know, I got my tickets out to PA for next year. Air, I booked my Airbnb a year in advance. So love and it. I lived in Philly. So it's getting to go back there finally. So okay. So what are the key dates? If I wanted to, can I still officiate for the 24-25 season? If I want to get my big behind out there and my loud mouth to call matches, what are the key dates? What's the cutoff for me to be an official this year? I don't believe there is one. Okay. So, so I could still get in the 24, 25 season if I yes, want. Yes, you can. Yeah. So we had a guy take the online class. I think it was two years ago in like November. I think he finished the class and then he started emailing me in like December, like, Hey, I want to get out there. I want to do some stuff. And he jumped in obviously doing like, freshman JV. And that's what we do. And since I, we, we go around and watch some of the new officials and I, I get them like JV events to, and I'll go work it with them like tournaments and stuff. And he got his license in like November, December timeframe. He was great. Like was very, very good. And um, so we're looking forward to him. He was out last year, had an injury. So coming back this year, but yeah, you can, you can get, go online, take the class. And like, I've had guys since it's all online and video, sign up and they're done in two days with the course. Um, is it the best experience for becoming an official? Are you a master at it? No, there's that. You still, we still plan hands-on, like we call them mechanics boot camps, where we get everybody in person and just do an eight hour session of like illegal holds, positioning on takedowns, line calls, near fall, um, just different situations that are really tough to cover by reading the book and what you see in those videos. So we do a whole mechanics boot camp to try to prep everybody and get them acclimated and everything. Um, but yeah, you could take the class November, December, and still do some that season, doing some freshman, JV, youth, um, junior high. Absolutely. Do you know the Jack Settics? The name sounds very familiar. Dan Jack Settic, Jake. These guys, one of them is like a silent movie villain. And this guy is like, I like, dude, these, these people scream at him and he's just like, it doesn't affect him. 
He's like a silent movie villain that thrives off getting yelled at. And he's pretty good, dude. I like him. I like Chesbro. I like I like, like a lot of these guys, man. I have good relationships with the guys. I like, I enjoy um the uh the officials. Um they're always when they do a good job, right? Yeah, of course. When I feel like they don't do a good job, then it bums me out a little bit. And I'm kind of like you, and I'm like, man, we can be better. We can get better. But we are, we're in a crisis mode right now. That's what we got to do. We got to recruit more officials. Uh, let's talk about some crazy matches. And I saw mm-hmm. you on a crazy match, and I don't know what you can tell me or can't tell me, right? Do you remember doing the rematch of the Ty Wilson? Oh, yeah. Aquila match. Absolutely. And okay. So I'm going to ask you about, it kind of got weird on the, on the edge, right? Mm -hmm. You were assisting, correct? Yes, I was. There was a time when Wilson picked him up and they went out of bounds and he cartwheeled with him and returned him with force to the mat. And it was a crazy match, right? Mm -hmm. In that scenario, what can you tell me about your conversation? Because I think, was it Wegerson? Was Wegerson the head? Yeah. Wegerson's good. Another very good official. Does a great job. Italian guy. Great great guy. What what are you guys talking about in that situation? Is there a conference? Does Todd Haverdell or whoever ask you guys, why wasn't that with force? Why wasn't that an illegal slam? What do you guys talk about if you're if you're huddling? Yeah, when we're when we're huddling, we're talking about what each other saw. I mean, um, at the end of the day, that that's one of the things when it comes down to officiating, it is that it's the head official's call. It's their final call. Now he was closer on that side. I was. I'm remembering I, you know, I was basically almost like in front of the head table and had like the, I don't know, was it at like a 90 degree view? Yeah, it would have been the like action. the back 90 degrees. So correct. He was, it, the action came right at him because I was, yeah. I was it, it started near the edge. So that's why I was over there at the head table and went that way. So that's all I, I went up to him and said, you know, what do you see? You know, you know, and, you know, he saw it and he said, you know, he didn't have it. He had, the action was fast and took them that way and he took them and picked them up and turned that way but he didn't have him taking them down with force gotcha. i didn't have it like it was coming towards him and away from me that i didn't have that view where i could definitely say oh yeah absolutely that he drilled him into the mat yeah um so that's why we stopped like, this call there it's just like when they had the the ankle <laughs> the ankle takedown call and what control is you yeah. know what a takedown is you know what taking someone down with forces you yes. and i know what it is Oh yeah. We know what it, we know it. I got, I, it's happened to me. You know, it's, it's a tough one. So that's, that's another one, but that match, the, what the, the, you know, what led to that though, um, was they gave, they let somebody choose neutral and overtime. Correct. Yes. The 30, 30. Yeah. 30, 30. And you can either go top or bottom, right? You cannot choose neutral. You can go, uh, top, he chose bottom, the he, guy go. Yeah, or he chose bottom. You can tell him neutral. There's a point. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So what? 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 What's the talking to you guys have been? Because I'm not going to ask you what your, you know, best worst matches are. We all know that that match, someone had to go in the system and override that, didn't they? So yeah, and um, what is that? Uh, flow or track? Like right. it doesn't even give right. you the option. For ne- it doesn't give you the option for neutral in those situations. So yeah, it's one of the situations where there's just, it's just a brain fart. I mean, and that's where it comes down. Like that's where I was referencing earlier with those, those 30 thirties and those ultimate ride outs. That is an intense situation. And you're thinking in your head as an official, like all the ways of where you got to go, making sure you remember like, Oh wait, if there's, you know, third in the ultimate ride out, there's, you know, the first stall is a stalemate and like things change, but this is the 30 30, but a lot of things are going through your mind and that's a, you know, was that a quarterfinal match? I mean, hot, heavy, intense match, two very, two very good wrestlers. Champ. Yeah. Hot yeah co- time coaches are, you know, very involved in it and it's a close match. So it's just a brain fart, you know, and it's one of the situations where we work as officials to make sure it never, ever happens to us. And unfortunately it did. And um, I know the officials that were on the mat, they're very, very good officials um, care a heck of a lot, but you know, it just, it's a brain fart and it happens and it's, you know, unfortunate how that went down. Um, yeah. And yeah, we definitely got to talk into, uh, you know, the officiating. Yeah, so, does everybody yeah. get a talk into at that point? I'm not going to yes. ask Andy, but yes, you, obviously being thorough is the biggest part. I, I believe. Um, yeah. So let's talk about one of the more egregious ones ever in the history of officiating 
Ian Miller. Ian oh, Miller. yeah, yeah. So another one where they had to go in and override the system, literally – the the program would not let the match. They had to go up and say no. He didn't have a riding point. Yeah, but in fact, he did have over a minute of riding time against Brian Rebuto in the quarterfinals of the 2015 NCAA tournament. In that situation, is that a brain fart? What's your opinion on that one? Because that's, that's I'm trying to remember how that all that whole match went. I've watched it a hundred times, and that, I mean, what was the final score in that match? Nine nine. Yeah, and it was, it was ten nine. Yeah, it was ten nine. Yeah. So they had to go in the system and override it. Mm-hmm. And of course, Cornell knew what was going on. Cornell, hey, let's wrestle. You know, he didn't yeah. really stand up, right? Um, let's get him on the line. Let's wrestle. I mean, of course, you know, Kyle Dakes in the front row, get him on the line. Yeah. He knows what's going on. They knew it's all those things that just, yeah, it's another, it's an infinite, infamous one that's just, you know, should never happen at those levels. I mean, at any level, but it, you know, because we're, I mean, you have, you know, you have your official, you're an official on the mat, you have officials working at tables, you know, things like that shouldn't happen. Another one that was just a few years ago or that just drove me nuts was um Campbell. Um, I can't remember was oh, it was, from uh, Campbell. Uh, yeah, it was uh Heil versus uh and I was on a 30 Oklahoma second State. ride out. Oklahoma State. Yeah. And the, the the best thing we can do is take it back to, you know, the the most fair thing we can do. Is t- what he said. The one the guy said, "Time is relative. We have to. The fairest thing we can do is just start them back at thirty seconds." Like, what are you talking about? Yes, dude, it was the head official. He goes, "No, we're not gonna do." He had ridden him down. for a good. Goes, Wait a minute, it's a real seconds. time video. What are you talking about? Yeah, no, we're not gonna do guesswork. Or so he said some insane thing, and poor Scotty Sentes and his staff. What a kick! And t- took gut, took a dude. took an all American away from them. Yes. That's a blood round. That was a blood yes. round. Yes. That was a bl- yes. Oh my god. Oh you know, they, and it was a Ohio kid too, right? Yeah, Ohio Campbell. And I was uh, like, like he, he rode him. I mean, he might have ridden him for a good 20, 25 seconds. He oh, literally man. had like so basically what you're saying, the the fairest thing we can do is set him back to 30 seconds. And now Ohio has to ride him for another 30. So we it's like basically to win that, he has to ride him for one minute where the guy is going yeah. crazy on bottom. Like it's so hard to do. It was ridiculous. It was totally ridiculous. I forget the Oklahoma State guy's name, but it was like it was egregious, actually. Yeah. But these ones where they got to go in and override the system. I mean, in that in that there's got to be. And I understand, dude, some of that sometimes that elapses over 45 seconds, a minute, a yeah. minute two minutes. Right. Like it's not it's not boom, boom. It's not no. like Paul's fleeing the mat call on, on Blaze, which is a split second call. Yeah. Right? This is something where you've got time to. Really let it burn and really and think. Let it burn. And Are we making second. the right decision here? Let's think. Whoa, why won't the program let us do that? You, you understand where I'm coming from, right? Yeah, and that's one of the things that I do when I'm out there. And it's, you know, it does get tough when it's those big matches and guys are going crazy and it's a high scoring affair. And, um, but I try to always keep a mental note of like what happened. And because sometimes again, it's not like this, the state tournament, state tournament, you have officials working the table, they do a very, very good job. But when you get into some matches during the season, the table workers just are not very good. I mean, you have usually students volunteering their time, you know, so it's understandable, but you work with them to to help them. And I always treat my table workers good because without them, we wouldn't be able to do it. But I keep a mental note and I'll like, I'll even like hold my points up and yell like four to two. And then like trying to keep, let them know like, Hey, adjust the score, start the clock, things like that. But I mean, you try to always, in as an official, keep a mental note of what the score is and how we got there because that kind of stuff does happen where it could be bad time or something like that, and you got to wipe points. And so it, it gets tough, but you try to always keep a mental note of where we are and how we got there. Okay. We've talked about ones. I didn't have to really put you on the spot that much and bring up maps that, maps that you uh, officiated and why calls were made and – we understand, but let's talk about the 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 elephant in the room. We have some enormous rule changes coming. Oh yeah, talk to me about that and how you're handling that right now because I know you're probably answering emails every day to your younger officials, your new officials, your officials just coming back. People maybe getting recertified or getting certified. What are the rule changes coming down for the 2024 2025 season? OHSAA wrestling. I love them. 
I'm happy with it. I mean, we're, we'll see how the three point takedown and the near fall. I mean, now we haven't got official word that we've adopted. I've, I've heard that we are, you know, I don't, I've heard, it's, no, I've heard it's a done thing as yeah, well. Yeah. You're it's, right. There's I no reason got, like, not to, um, we'll see how the three point takedown plays in. I don't mind it. Uh, the two, three and four point near fall. Don't mind it at all. You know, you know, two, two count is two points, three count, three points, four count is four points. Makes it very seamless. Three point takedown. The one I'm most excited about is the one point in bounds. It makes it so much easier. I mean, in Ohio and the National Federation with high school, um, it's been that two points in bounds, but it changes based on the situation. Like if we're near fall and the defensive wrestler both shoulder or our shoulders down on the mat out of bounds, that's all of his supporting points. So if the offensive guy has a foot in, the defensive guy has two feet in, but his shoulders on the mat out of bounds we're out of bounds because the offensive guy only has one point in. I mean, it changes all that. It makes it to where it allows wrestling to continue when it should continue. Now we go cylinder. When you say that, is it cylinder? <laughs> um, my you, have have a, you have to have a point in a point has to be in, in like on the mat is what I'm understanding. So it's not cylinder then. No, I don't think so. Cylinder is the outer space. You know, a cylinder yes, is the yeah, outer it's, space. It's both, like college. Yeah. It's, uh, it's yeah. outer space, right? Like it's like, I could be wrong. I haven't, you know, we haven't got any kind of clarification. That's, kind of waiting a, that's on that. huge, right? That's huge. Yeah. Because if it's cylinder, <laughs> you don't even have to be in there. You can be hovering over. Yeah, hovering over. Praise. But, yeah, but you got it, me fired up now. I yeah. got to go check on that. Yeah. I'm call, guessing, call though. Kobe, get him on here. <laughs> I think it's going to be one point, though. If yeah. I mean, that makes sense. Because how can you go to cylinder with a high school guy? Yeah. I think I'm I'm leaning towards it's going to be the point. But it 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 makes it so much easier on us officials. Like, I mean, when I'm, when I'm alone, even when I have an assistant, you know, I'm when it's a fall or near fall out of bounds, I'm looking at the shoulders and I'm coming back up to check the knees. I'm going back down. Like it's, it makes it a lot easier. I can just like, Oh yes, yeah, foot's in bounds. Okay. Well, you know, I'm still looking for a fall. I don't have to go back and forth all that time. Um, now a lot of people are saying, you know, there's not, not as much room in high school gyms, a small, we already do that. We already, even with two points in bounds, we have to call for safety all the time. Doesn't yeah. change that. We're well, still Iron Man, best example. Yeah. We're, I mean, even the Ohio state tournament, you have mats where the, the lines are touching each other between yeah. the two mats yeah. happens all the time. You still call for safety. We're going to do that. Nothing changes there, but if the space allows, which a lot of gyms do, we're going to let wrestling go. It's going to well, happen. And the right guy's going to win the right, the right wrestler. Any other glaring changes, no riding time added or anything like that into the high school? Not as right now, no. Okay. Yeah, that, but that, I'm excited about the changes. You, I think it's good. I, I love the one point. It's been like all of us officials, and, you know, that's one of the things I get yelled at the most is when guys getting stuck out of bounds and I blow it out of bounds because there's only one point in. And even though the defensive wrestler has two feet in bounds as well, the shoulders on the mat out of bounds were out, and I just get harped on by the crowd because they don't understand, like, I rule they're out and I have to call it. Um, hated doing it, but you know, that's what we're there for. I mean, got to call, got to call by the rules. That's what the rule is there. Okay. Were there any best worst matches that you want to talk about that I did not bring up? Um, that I've officiated. Well, it, well either or, either or something that was controversial or something you want to talk I about. I mean, I, I can't, I mean, I, I can't really get into, oh, why did I make this call, that call? But, I mean, there's been a lot of great matches. I mean, I mean, any time it's a barn burner, close match like that, you make the call and coaches, some coach and wrestlers are going to be happy. Some are going to be, you know, not so happy. It happens. I mean, there's a whole, like, uh, two years ago, my first state tournament, I got the D1 semis. and Oh, wow. Did you? How many of them? All of them? I did. I probably was head in probably, probably like eight or nine matches. Oh, okay. So the way it works, just to people who don't understand, there's two semifinal mats for each, and they're running simultaneously. Mm -hmm. So you get D1, and usually those matches are back that are side by side. Um, now all of them are side by side. It used to be the um, the Division One had the end zone where it had its own mat, and then they were mm -hmm. kind of like caddy corner. But uh, it's wild to think because when you talk about that. You were eight or nine. You were the head on. Well, because what happens? It was at least seven. Because what happens is you can't as a as a official, you can't do. We're in teams of three, and you can't officiate your own district. And so I'm from Cincinnati, and unfortunately there wasn't a lot of Cincinnati in that on my mat. 
So I was head because, you know, if there was a Cleveland, we had a Cleveland guy on a crew and they can't do Cleveland matches and that's a lot of them. So I, I probably did about seven matches at least I'd wow. say, but I had, uh, I had Wilson Herman, which was a freaking awesome match oh, yeah. um, two years ago. And then, um, I mean, at Ironman this year, it, I had, I had the last match at Ironman this year on day one, which ended at 11 59 PM. Okay. That was the one we were really, really, really fired up about. Was it one of the Miller brothers from St. Ed's? Um, I had, it was one of the final, I had Ethan Burden against, uh, I think it was, was it Hinkle from Blair? Then it, yes. it was, came, yes. came down to right out. Crazy. I mean, there's just, I mean, and then I had Lockett Hinkle in the, in the concert semis the Ooh. next day. I mean, there's just, there's so many good matches hey, that happened. Did you realize what you just said? Lockett Hinkle in the Kansi semi I know. Yeah. <laughs> Those guys are really good. Yeah. <laughs> I think the last time those guys have wrestled in a Kansi semi, either one. Yeah, it was, I mean, there's just so many freaking Lock good matches. Look at the world champ. Yeah. <laughs> he it's just wild. the U20s. Yep. He's a high school kid. Hey, Lockett and Blaze have only both won the Ironman as freshmen. <laughs> That's wild. Dude, they're both world and champions. They're freaks. Yeah, it's just that. I mean, that freaking tournament is just. Ugh. I mean, it's it's it's. Are you best. back? I mean, Are you back? I haven't heard yet. I hope so. I mean, it's a. It was an awesome experience. I love it up there. I mean, but, I mean, just the coaches you get to see, the wrestling you get to see, the officials you get to work with. I worked with a couple of PA guys all weekend. Um, one of them, um, his name slipped in my mind, but he's an ACC official. Well, he's an NCAA official. Does a lot of ACC, but. Great people. I mean, you learn a lot and just seeing the, just the atmosphere and everything. And then this year was the girls, the first year the girls were up there. Yeah. Um, but it was, it was wild, but yeah, it was just uh, the 11, I blew my whistle at 11 50. I looked at the TV and I'm like, Oh my gosh, 11 59 PM. We didn't get back to our hotel until like, it was like two 15 or something. Cause then when were you we, back in the gym? What's that? When were you back in the gym the next I day? Wanna... Nine. Seven. Like no, it was like seven thirty, seven or eight o'clock, maybe. Woo. How's how fo- you know, you you take this real seriously, man? This is like you take this like you treat this like a full time job, even though you have a full time job. Yeah. Um, how zoned in and how focused are you, and how prepared are you for an Ironman or an OHSA state tournament, Division One semifinals or finals? How zoned in and how focused and prepared are you, Elliot? Uh, Barry, I mean, you, you have to be, and I, it goes back to like, I take it like I did if I was wrestling in it. Like I, the last thing I, it bugs me so much if I get something wrong. So, I mean, it's, you gotta, you know, do what you can to stay zoned in. Like I don't even run and take breaks to grab food or anything. And that was my biggest mistake at Ironman. Cause it was like seven o'clock or six 45. They're like, Hey, food's here. And I'm like, ah, I'll get something when we're done. Cause I figured we had like two hours left. Next thing I know it's 1159. So we left and that's where we went. Like me, it was me and Chaz who we were talking about earlier and a couple of the Dayton officials. We ran and got food. The only thing open was sheets. So I got a scrumptious dinner. At MTL, sheets. huh? So, but Hashtag getting, barf. Yeah. Getting Sorry, back to the sheets. Gym. Sorry, Sheets. Go Ohio Cast Podcast. <laughs> not. Does not. No longer uh, endorses you. But it was. Yeah, you stay zoned in, you stay focused. I mean, <clears throat> I like to have fun with my, you know, my friends, my official friends and stuff. But when you're on the mat, I mean, it's it's go time. You want to get everything right and be as prepared as you can. But, I mean, I'll, like I said, I'll show you some of the stuff I have when we're done here. I mean, we very much, like, I I try to take the same approach I did while I was wrestling because I never, ever want to cost a kid a match, especially at, at any level, especially when it comes to, like, an Ironman, a state tournament, anything like that would be i wouldn't be able to sleep for like a month it would kill me i love it i love that you're just that into it not that <laughs> you're gonna be up for a month <laughs> but I already am. i mean already am right now i mean ncw football college football just came out so it's killing me right now <laughs> I, gotta, I gotta i mean i'm trying to take kennesaw state to the glory the glory land here and ncw football champions i love Dynasty it right. what else you got anything else for me no, if anybody's out there listening and they want to get into officiating, I mean, like I said, it's right now, it's very easy to go on my OSHA, create your profile, sign up for a class, choose wrestling, sign up for a class, preferably the Cincy class, because I'm so great, even though it's, 
you get the same experience from anybody. It's all online, but you know, it's, I think people, it's a, it's a very eye opening experience. It's, it is much different. Someone like me, I wrestled high school, college, coached the college level, and then making the jump into officiating it. It's, it's a very, it's very much an eye opening experience. Cause it's like in the chair, it's easy to take down. It's near fall, but you're trying to like, you're watching and you're there and it's, getting in the right position to make the call. It's, it's fun. I, I love it. I love that. You love it. I it's love the experience. Elliot. Thank you for the time, man. Uh, Got to thank our, uh, our partners, defense soap, defend with you a belt, spider, mat tape, check out www.oac backslash spider, get some fresh new mat tape. And of course our Cincinnati based, Barbarian Apparel, Conquer the Impossible. Uh, got my BA oh, yeah. on here. I love it. BA on, you got it on you right now. Mom works there, doesn't she? She does. That's what, yeah, I think she she stole this from Josh. That's how I got it. Sorry, Josh, I'll Venmo you tomorrow. Elliot <laughs> Spence, thank you for the time. Stick around. We'll talk a little bit more and uh, talk a little bit more officiating. Elliot Spence, Ohio High School Athletic Association official. Stick around.